Welcome, everybody. We have all 20 of you in the room and the other 40, 50, 60, however many out there still. Thank you for being here on time. We actually are going to give it about another minute or so before we officially get things going, just to make sure that we've got everybody on Zoom has a chance to get into the room. Uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the fact that oftentimes when we say start, people don't always get in there right away. So uh, we'll, we'll give everybody a moment to, to get into the room. And uh, of course, usually as we start the production here, people out there, they're in the hallways start to hear things and start to trickle in and see what all's going on. So again, thank you everybody for being here. And not only that, for anybody that was here last month, obviously you paid attention when we said, hey, by the way, we're gonna have to change the the date and it's not the second Tuesday it's actually the first Tuesday so again congratulations and thank you for being here on time and being in the right place at the right time which in the game of real estate can be very very important yes indeed right absolutely all right so again we'll go ahead and get things rolling here so welcome everybody to our April 5th general meeting of CFRI. Uh, most of the introductory stuff I know most people have seen, but remember, we always have new people and guests and others, and we want to make sure everybody gets the full set of information about CFRI. So we'll start off with this first slide that we always do that says, hey, if you didn't realize this, CFRI exists for a very important purpose, and that is to make sure that we are providing an opportunity for everyone everyone who wants to learn more about real estate. So not only that, but providing opportunity where you will, you can come in and learn things. You can get educational opportunities. You can network. You can talk to other people. You can network with like-minded people, people that, that are in the game of real estate and in many cases doing multiple transactions, maybe for multiple years, and have a lot of experience that you can draw from. So that's our whole point here is to make sure that we're providing those opportunities for everybody. Um, disclaimer that you will see in front of, I would say just about every meeting that we do, it should be every meeting that we do. And that is that again, when you are at any CFRI events, please keep in mind that the person that's up there leading the meeting, unless they happen to be a resident expert on something, for example, maybe a CPA, maybe they're an attorney, Otherwise, the information that you're getting from CFRI, make sure that you are, again, talking to somebody that knows exactly what they're talking about. There's a lot of people in CFRI just because they have joined or maybe even thing in a meeting. That does not always mean they know what they're talking about. Uh, we had a great example this week in our Real Estate 101 class that we did. Actually, it wasn't this week. I apologize. It was last week. But we did uh, in our Real Estate 101 class, we were talking about ethics. And we had a great example where somebody came to a CFRI meeting. They started talking to somebody. The person talked the talk, walked the walk, sounded like they really knew what they were talking about. Somebody decided, okay, you know what? I'm going to invest with this person. Sounds like a good idea. I mean, obviously they're here at a CFRI meeting that, you know, they know what they're doing. Only turns out that was actually their first time at a CFRI meeting. They were not a member, they were guests and the person did not do their due diligence and that did not go so well. All right. Yeah. We don't like to hear stories like that, but that's the reason this disclaimer slide is here. Again, you need to make sure that you're consulting people that really know the business. So if you need to get a tax question answered, get somebody, not just an accountant, but somebody that knows real estate accounting and can give you, yeah, Mark, I mean, you and I both know that. That is so, so critical because the types of deductions and things that you can take that I, I hate to use the word creativity because people use, you know, hear that in the realm of like the IRS and like, oh, wait a minute, you're trying to avoid things. No, no. Well, actually, you are trying to avoid paying taxes. That's legal. <laughs> it's the uh, not paying your taxes that you should not do. But yes, take every advantage you can, but do so by getting good counsel. That's the whole point. All right. 
I'll say this a couple of times, and hopefully everybody's heard it before, but if you're new or newer, we almost every meeting that we have, there is a meeting after the meeting. It's where a lot of networking take pla takes place. It's where you can talk to other investors, you can learn more. There's even more that goes on as a part of meeting after the meeting today. That meeting after the meeting is to be held at Graffiti Junction. Now specifically pay attention because there's more than one of these, but Graffiti Junction College Park. Now that is at 2401 Edgewater Drive. So if that's something that you're interested in, we'll be wrapping up at eight o'clock here. People head right on over there and uh, you can learn lots of good things, deals that get done, uh, a lot of good information that you can get by going to meeting after the meeting. So keep that in mind. And like I said, you will hear that more than once. Now, CFI member only announcements. That means we started this again last month and we're gonna do it again this month and continue doing it. So you'll hear more and more of this. But what we like to do is for anybody that has a property they'd like to sell. Now this has to be something you actually have under contract. So it can't just be something like you've got the listing or whatever, or you know about it. You have to actually have it under contract. Obviously, as the sign says, you have to be a CFRI member to make announcements. Or if there's something particular that you are looking for and you wanna make an announcement on that, you have 30 seconds to make an announcement. If anybody would like to do that, come on up here to the podium on the right-hand side. It's on my right-hand side, it's on your left. Ron, you don't have one tonight? Surely you have one. I was gonna say, Ron has always got something. Yeah, that's right. All right, Ron, come on up here since you're the only one so far. All right, everybody, this is Ron Smith. Ron, all you. Yes, 33 year member. I'm looking for properties with termite damage, structural damage, uh, additions that have been put on without permits. And Mark Orman and I bring them into compliance and get them ready for sale or rent or whatever. I'll take even properties with title issues. I try to stay within about 40 minutes of here, but I'll go anywhere in the country for the right deal. 407-948-2592. That's me. Phone number one more time. 407-948-2592. Thanks. Yep. And Ron, if you'll put your information on the on the uh, sheet that uh, Rob is putting his on for us. Rob, come on up. Everybody, this is Rob Arnold. He is not only a board member, but our legislative chair. Rob, all you. Oh. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Rob Arnold. I, I am looking for sinkhole damage properties, foundation damage properties, anywhere in the state of Florida or the Southeast United States. Uh, if you come across anything uh, and uh, not, if you're not sure what to do with it, or you want to sell it, wholesale it, 407-375-4567 uh, is me, 375-4567. Thank you. Right. Awesome. Thank you very much. So like I said, you're going to see that more and more. And uh, I'm sure as more and more people remember, hey, we used to be doing that a while ago. We will have more opportunity for people to do that. We will do it at the beginning of the meeting. And again, it's one of those things where what we'll do is we'll ask you to come down to the front, write your information on the sheet where uh, Ron is actually putting his information right now. What we do with that is we make sure we get a, a copy of that. We put it in the Facebook members only group so that people can see it as well. And like like you saw, you get a chance to make announcements. So thank you gentlemen for doing that. And let's move right along. Now, again, if you didn't know, CFRI is not just CFRI. We are a proud member of National RIA, which is of course a collective of a lot of real estate associations. Not too many of them are nonprofit like we are. A lot of them are for-profit RIAs. But nonetheless, we are a part of this group because one of the things it does for our members is it provides a lot of discounts. And here are some examples of those discounts. Now, by a show of hands in the audience, how many of you have used one or more of these discounts? Wow, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. A little bit, a uh, few more hands than we had last time. I expect that to keep growing as you become a member, if, if by chance you're not a member. But a lot of good examples up here. And uh, again, we'll highlight a couple of these as we go through, but we can't highlight all of them. Just be aware that if you want to know more about these, you can go on CFRI's website, CFRI.net. And again, log in with your membership and you can see more information about these particular deals. If there's something that you find that uh, you don't find enough information about. You can always ask Buffy a little bit more about it. Uh, you can also check out the information on National RIA's website as well. 
Here's one of the ones in particular that we do like to highlight because it is such a good benefit, and that is the Home Depot discount. Uh, essentially, to participate in this program, uh, it, you do have to follow a couple of steps. And if you're wondering, well, what are those steps? One of the easiest ways to find out is to look at the CFRI newsletter. And that's because in the newsletter, we actually have steps that tell you, here's what you do. But to make it quick and easy for you, you basically have to have a Home Depot account. Your email address for the Home Depot account does need to be the email address you use for CFRI because every once in a while they audit the two. And if that report doesn't line up, you may not get your rebate. But as you can see, there are some excellent rebates here. So you've got that 2% purchase rebate, you've got paint discounts, you've got bulk purchase discounts. But in order for that to count, again, you have to have properly registered your account. And the other part that's really critical is you go into the cards, uh, it's actually called cards and accounts or cards and gift cards, something like that. But anyway, under cards, and you register any card you're going to use at Home Depot. So that would be a credit card, it could be a gift card, it could be a debit card. And when you register those, you put a little code associated with it. Uh, it's right there in blue, in RIA. And that's what alerts them to make sure that they track it for the National RIA program and make sure that you get your rebates and you can get all the rest of the details, of course, online. How many people are part of the CFRI members only Facebook group? Show of hands for that. Oh, excellent. Even more people. Good, 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 good. All right. Well, if again, it's uh, called the members only Facebook group because you do need to be a CFRI member. Uh, if you're not currently a member, we're going to talk more about that in a moment, but you can certainly become a member this evening. We would love to have more and more members. And if you are a member of uh, CFRI, you can join that CFRI members only Facebook group and get a lot of valuable information. One of the gentlemen that was just up here, Rob Arnold, as I said, is our legislative chair. He does an excellent job of keeping an eye on what's going on with the laws and letting people know, and that can be extremely valuable. Rob, was it today that you were actually going to talk in Orange County? Is that right? Uh, I spoke this See, there you go. He spoke this morning at Orange County Commission, right? <laughs> Yes, so he's out there doing stuff for you all the time. You wanna keep track of that? That's a great way to do it as a part of that CFRI members only Facebook group. A lot of other resources, of course, available on our website, cfri.net. You can go there. If you're a member, you obviously can log in and get to all kinds of additional stuff, including more information about the business members. So if you're not sure who is a good CPA, who is a good attorney, who is somebody that is a part of CFRI, that might be a good resource for a particular line of work you're looking for, then that business member directory can be useful. Okay. Now, I bet we don't see as many hands for this. How many people have read the April issue of the CFRI newsletter? Oh, all right, three of you, thank you. Yay! <laughs> All right, now it's only been out a couple of days. I'll give you, I'll give you that, all right? So uh, typically it's out by the first of the month, if not right beforehand. But we do make that available to everybody. There's a lot of good articles in there. In fact, I kind of happen to know that not too many people read it because the president's article that I wrote for that one said, hey, pay attention. If you read this article and you come to the main meeting and you ask me for a key, I'll give you a key to a house. I didn't say which house. I didn't say it would actually open the door. But it also said at the very end of the article, thank you very much for reading it, April Fools. <laughs> So see, that's how I knew not too many people, because so far, nobody tonight has come up and said, hey, what about that key you were talking about? <laughs> oh, you read the whole thing. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. <laughs> all right. I do appreciate it. No, in all seriousness, there's a lot of good information in there. Uh, not only can you get to the April magazine, but of course, by going to the website, you can see the history of those newsletters going back several years. So there's a lot of good information in there. And, um, and, and even things like being able to catch up on, hey, maybe you missed the deal of the month or the dud of the month, uh, those, as long as we get the article from whoever was doing the presentation, those will be in there as well. So again, don't hesitate to check that out. 
All right. If you do not currently have a CFRI name tag and you're a CFRI member and you want a CFRI name tag, you can order them. It's not a very difficult procedure. In fact, you can do it on the website. Uh, you just go and log into the website and pay the $8 and you can get one. Now, I want to stress one thing because somebody asked a very interesting question last month and they said, hey, I logged into the website and I see how to order my name tag, but how do I order my husband's name? tag and the answer was your husband has to log in and order that name tag <laughs> because it's all it's going to be tied to your login so that's why it was done that way um, but anyway yes it's very easy to do now focus group meetings and county group meetings. We're gonna talk more about those as we go along. One of them in particular that we'll talk about is the landlording group, because we're gonna be talking about the landlording panel here in just a little bit. But uh, almost all of these meetings are now back in person. We still have two exceptions to that rule, Osceola and Seminole County. Now, that may be a little bit of a bummer that they're not being held in person, however, if they're being held via Zoom, that means that pretty much anybody can go. So show of hands here, how many people have been to one of the Osceola or Seminole County groups via Zoom? Oh, fantastic, that's awesome, thank you. Thank you very much for doing that, that's great. Hopefully we'll be able to get back in person and those soon. Uh, we got some logistical issues. I know like with Osceola, with KUA, they're, they're really slow about letting people back in there. So uh, anyway, maybe soon. All right, now, in addition to the other educational opportunities that you will see throughout the year, we're going to be talking about several of them. But one of the ones that's wrapping up, and in fact, we've got the last class coming up soon here, is the REI 101 Academy, the Real Estate 101 Academy, which was a total of six classes over uh, pretty much every two-week period, the exception being this time we sped it up by one week because we've got Easter coming up. And that last class, if anybody wants to go to it, you can. We still have availability for that last one. Fern, or should I say the lovely and talented Fern Sieber, because that's how she always introduces herself. Uh, Fern is going to be teaching this one on funding the deal. And uh, again, CFRI members, you're going to see that you get a discount on pretty much everything. So that's a great deal as far as being a member. And then non-members, price is up there as $80. Again, that's the last of that class series. But if, you, if that was something that you were really interested in and want to know, hey, how am I going to fund my deal? This is a way you could find out more about that by that class that is coming up April 7th, which is this Thursday, so two days from today at the CFR Education Center. Now, anybody that is trying to get their professional housing provider certification, their PHP points or PHP certification, if you haven't heard of that before, Ask some of our members, any of them that have it, we'll tell you more about it. But the idea is it's a program where you can attend a set number of classes and accumulate credits. And after you've accumulated enough credits in the various concentrations, so things like insurance and law and so on, when you have enough of those, you can actually apply for and get a certification that says you are PHP certified. Now, even if you don't have any interest in PHP certification, insurance is an excellent topic and one that is often hard to get. We do not always have that class available for people, but Colleen, who was on a panel that we had uh, either last month or the month before, excellent, excellent, knowledgeable person, knows a lot about insurance. She's gonna be teaching that class on April 21st. So not this Thursday, but of course, two Thursdays after that. And if you are trying to get your PHP points, this one can be very, very important because again, like I said, this one is not offered nearly as often insurance and look at these prices if you're a member you can get that as low as 29 bucks all right through april 15th you'll see a lot of places where we talk about the early bird gets the worm the point being in the field of real estate if you're on the ball if you get there in time if you're one of the first ones there you're typically the one that's going to get the deal so it's very important to take action now, you're going to hear us talk about this one a couple of times because our guests tonight, when we get to the panel, are going to be talking about landlording. And we are having a landlording academy coming up. When is it? Thank you, Mark. At least one person is going to answer that. Let's try that again. When is the class? 
<laughs> now we're getting some observation. Friday the 13th. Yeah, sorry. I love how I asked that and everybody's like, Friday the 13th. Wow, the excitement is killing me. Let's try that one more time. And make it like you mean it. When is this class? Right. Friday the 13th. Yay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. You can see you guys need a little bit more energy, but that's okay. No worries. No worries. Yes, it is Friday the 13th. It is Friday, May 13th. So it's an all-day session, as you can see, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And hey, look at that. What a bonus. Lunch included. All right. Now remember I said early bird gets the worm. So if you get signed up by the 10th, look at that. CFRI members, 99 bucks. If you don't get it done by the 10th, but you get it before the, the first of May, you're still getting a discount. And of course, as we said, if you're a member, you're going to continue to get these discounts. So it's important to keep that in mind. Now, this one has a total of eight PHP credits with it. So a lot of education going on. And again, these folks will be talking about what's going to happen to that Landlording Academy. We're going to cover some basics tonight, but you get a lot of good information in this particular event. Now, when we get to the end of our presentation tonight, we'll do some Q&A with our panel, and the very last thing we do is we do some door prizes. But as we always tell everybody, hey, if you're looking to get one of those Home Depot gift cards, you do have to be present to win. So we will draw those names, and then we'll start going through them. And those of you that were here last month, remember, we went through a few names where, unfortunately, people didn't win because they weren't here, right? All right, so you have to be here to win. Now, if you haven't seen this segment before, you have really been missing out because because the deal and or dud of the month is where we get a chance to see what somebody has done with real estate. Now, of course, that does not mean that it was always a huge success. We love it when they are. That's a deal. But we also know that you do not learn anything without making mistakes. And that is one of the ways that we are all going to learn is if somebody is willing to come up here and share a dud. And not everybody is willing to do that. Not everybody wants to stand up here and go, oh yeah, by the way, this one didn't work out so well. But we do have a few people that will do that and we greatly appreciate it. Either way, if you have a deal or a dud, we do want to hear about it and we do want you to be a, a, a speaker that comes up here and tells us about it. Don't get all upset and worried about being up on stage and speaking. Phil does an excellent job of just quizzing you and all you have to do is stand and look at Phil and answer some questions. You don't have to worry about the audience being out there, I promise. Trust me, I'm not worried about any of you. You're not even there. Wow, really good group. Okay, I'm not going to try stand up this week, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, no kidding though. Uh, Phil George is, is our VP and he is going to do our deal and dud of the month. Phil, if you would come on up here. Big round of applause for Phil George's. And when your guest comes up, I can grab mic one. Okay. All right. Hey, good, good evening, everybody. How are you doing today? <laughs> Like um, Jay said, this is a segment where we ask members to come up and share a deal or a dud. A deal is obvious. It's a deal where you made some money. And a dud is where it didn't quite work out as planned. So we have two presenters tonight that's going to give you two very unusual deals that you don't normally see. This is not your 3-2 and I made 40 grand, okay? So the first presenter I'm going to have come up is Jeff Strutt. Come up, Jeff. I guess you can say on that side. Not say right Check. So, Jeff, um, we have a very unusual deal today. Um, but before we do that, introduce yourself. Tell the audience how long you've been part of CFRI, um, you know, what kind of deals you've worked on. Name's Jeff Strzok. I'm a commercial broker, uh, also a contractor. I've uh, been in CFRI about five years. Um, I've been in other RIAs in other parts of the country as well. Um, flipped a bunch of houses, owned a bunch of rentals, going back several decades. Uh, and now I'm getting into some unique stuff. Uh, I bought this industrial building, 12,000 square foot industrial building, and the cabinet shop that's operating inside of it. So this is not just straight real estate. This is 
real estate along with a business, correct? Correct. A real estate along with a business. And in Florida statutory law, a business is actually considered real estate. Okay. So it's, it's really two real estate deals. Great. So what made you interested in this deal? Uh, I had a friend back in 2017 that got me interested in another similar deal in another state. Uh, and I said, well, I'm more working on multifamily and trailer parks, and this is the direction I'm going. And he showed me some offering memorandums. And I looked at the numbers, and I said, this makes a lot of sense. Let's do this. And him and I did that deal in another state um, in his backyard. And then last year, I did this deal on my own right here in Sanford. So how did you learn how to evaluate a deal like this? I had a business, I had a home improvement business, um, and I was looking to sell it at one time, and I read some books and took some courses on what makes a business valuable. Uh, and selling it. Uh, instead of selling it, I decided to keep it, leverage the equity to buy another one. Okay, and how'd you come across this deal? Uh, this was uh, through a business broker. A business broker. And they gave you all the numbers. Uh, yeah, I looked at probably 200 offering memorandums. Uh, I was telling a partner at the time, we're not ready to do a deal. Uh, and then I found this one and I said, something doesn't look right. Shouldn't be selling that cheap. Now he said something, offering memorandum. That's the, for those of you who don't know, an offering memorandum is a packet of information that contains all the numbers, all the demographics, all the description, everything you really need to know about a commercial or multifamily property. So, you know, you guys may in a house say, oh, I'm gonna get the listing, you know, and it has a couple of uh, pieces of information on the listing. But when you have an offering memorandum, it's usually 10 pages or more of information about that property um, that will help you make a good decision on whether you want to purchase that property. So now you got the offering memorandum. Tell me where you go from there. So I got the offering memorandum and uh, the numbers don't seem right for the size of the business and the size of the real estate. They're just not asking enough money. And I think, well, what's going on here? Why is it priced so cheap? So I read through the 20 page memorandum and I call the broker and I start talking to him. And start finding out what's going on. It turns out the operator of the business, he owns the business and the real estate, same guy. He's 20 loans short term, huge amounts of debt. He's on the edge of bankruptcy. He needs a white knight to come in and bail him out. And I decide that's going to be me. Okay. So continue. So we do a letter of intent. Uh, Commercial deals you a letter of intent rather than just an offering. Um, and um, we go back and forth for about two months with negotiating that. And then it finally goes to contract in July of 2020. Uh, then I take the package to a lender who wants to do an SBA 7A loan. Uh, those are about as fun as 500 paper cuts and a bottle of hot sauce. So that lender failed and we went to another lender and another and another and we finally found somebody that could make the deal work and we ended up closing in June of 21. So the deal took a whole year to put together. Uh, I actually had to loan the business money so it could make payroll a couple of times uh, and then that was converted into my down payment. Okay, so he said a couple of things there, and I don't want you guys to keep me confused, so I'm just going to reiterate points of it. Um, he mentioned a letter of intent. Now, when you buy regular residential, you just go straight to contract. You know, I want to buy your house, X, Y, Z, you put a contract in. In business and commercial, you write a one-page letter called a letter of intent. It's non-binding, but it tells the seller what you're willing to do. I'm willing to buy this property at X price. Um, I need this many days of due diligence. I need you to provide me X, Y, Z as far as due diligence information. I need the taxes. I need the insurance payments. I need your utilities bills. I need your bank statements. All of that is drafted up in a letter of intent. And you submit that to the owner or to the broker of record. Um, in your case, it was directly to the owner, right? I was through the broker because okay. there was a business broker in the middle. So you submit that. And if they agree, they'll sign that. 
that. And then you take it to contract. And the reason why it's done like that is because a business contract and a residential contract is very different. A business contract has a lot of language in it that can vary from property to property. Whereas, you know, in a single family house, you get a far bar and it's got everything that could happen or whatever. Um, but in a commercial property, there is a lot of variables that will go into a contract. So that's why you don't waste your time filling out a contract, paying the lawyer for all of that when they might say no. Okay. So you send them a letter of intent. If they say yes to that, then you commit to a contract. Okay. So now you got the money. Go. Okay. Yeah. So we did about eight or nine weeks of back and forth with the letter of uh, intent. It went to contract. Uh, we worked for close to a year doing this SBA loan. Uh, the SBA loans, the good part is the rates are great and you can get in with 10% down. Um, what else can I say about biz businesses are valued based on a multiplier of the profits. Uh, it's usually one to five times the profits depending on the size of the business and the industry. Uh, some of you are used to thinking in cap rates that translates to like a 15, 20, 30% cap rate. So it's a pretty good return. It's a ton of work. It is some risk. Um, and it, it takes a lot of skill. Now the following pictures are what the cabinet business does. So we're going to continue with that. Um, so this is some work that the cabinet business does some renovation, but go ahead and speak to the slide as you have Oh, okay. I see what it's doing. Um, okay, so how do you value industrial property? Uh, basically, the same as valuing a house. You comp it. You look at the building construction. Is it tilt-up concrete, a metal building? You look at the amount of land, and you look at what other stuff is sold for. Uh, sometimes you'll see something sold for a higher amount uh, because a lease on that building will add value, uh, especially if it's a corporate tenant. Uh, Amazon wouldn't rent anything this small, but if they were, or a place like that, then a buyer as an investor would be paying for the shell of the building and for the value of the lease, especially if it was a longer lease, like 10 or 15 years. Um, this one had the business inside of it. I was obviously buying the building for my own use. Uh, so I was paying about empty shell price. Uh, I did pay full price for the building. Uh, and we don't normally do that as real estate investors. But the reason I did that is because I got the business for probably half of what it's really worth. So you're saying the building was actually actually worth 1.8. Uh, yeah. But the business was worth $4 million. Yeah, so I figure I got a home run on the business. The business needs a place. It's already in that building. Might as well pick up that building, too. Now, given that commercial property is not the same like a residential, how did you do the comps? Uh, so for the building, um, I comped it to empty buildings that had about the same land and traffic. Um, and uh, for the business, I comped it to other businesses in that industry and looked at the multiplier of profits that they sold for. So as you said, businesses are usually sold by multiplier of the profit. So if a business makes, you know, a million bucks a year and it's a five multiplier, it's five million, right? Correct. That'll be a okay. $5 million valuation. So that, that's how you go about comping the business aspect of it. It's also the same way you figure out the uh, multifamily as well. There's a multiplier as well. So continue with, tell us about the, um, the business now. Okay, so the business, uh, 20 employees and some subcontractors, this is some of their work they do. Um, we're getting a lot of stuff in order uh, with the business, which is going to add a lot of value to the business. Um, even though it's a fairly sizable business, I received the proverbial shoebox of receipts and the accounting system was a spreadsheet here and a spreadsheet there. Uh, so just by cleaning that up, we're adding value to the business. And then we're cleaning up a lot of the systems and that's gonna add a lot of value, making things more efficient. Um, now, one thing we can do to add value to a business is we can grow the business. The bigger the business, the higher the multiplier it sells for. So if you double the size of the business, you're not doubling the value of the business, you're gonna be like two and a half times the value just by doubling the business. That's a several year thing. So this business was making how much when you when you first um, took over? Uh, 
uh, this business was doing about 450 a month in revenues when we first took over. Okay. And we're up to about 600 now. And what time frame? Um, well, we closed July, well, June 30th of 21 is when we closed. Okay. So we're about nine months in. Now, the SBA loan, tell us about that. Uh, so the SBA loan, uh, to say it's full doc would be an understatement. Um, they screen everything. They sent uh, appraisers out to my rental properties because it is full recourse. Um, so they had appraisers go out to my rental properties in Florida, other parts of Florida. In, I got stuff in Alabama. They sent appraisers out there. They checked everything. I have another business. They appraised that. They wanted to know everything. Um, so that was a lot of headache, and that's why it took a full year to get the financing. Um, then we did a seller note uh, for two reasons. One, it was um, easier to finance it, and also that way I have security after closing that if anything crops up after closing, I can take it off the seller note. Uh, and that is what happened. We discovered more debt after closing that was hidden, and I had to pay that off and that's coming off the seller now. Okay. Now, you heard him say non-recourse. There's two types of loans you can get um, when you're doing commercial stuff, especially like multifamily. You can get an, um, a full recourse, as he just described, which is where they do a full forensic insight on your business and your whatever else you have. Those are the painful ones. And then there's non-recourse. In multifamily, you can do non-recourse, and that means unless you do something wrong, Wrong, intentionally, you can walk away from the property, you know, um, so it's not a problem because they're going to they're take the property back a multifamily. So there's recourse and there's non-recourse. You want the non-recourse if you can get it. Um, if you can get it. <laughs> if you can get it. So, so talk some more about what, um, let me ask you a question. This is my own question. Um, EIDL, why didn't you try to get some of that money? Uh, um, I did actually, well, we applied with another business that I'm a partner in, um, but we were too late for EIDL with this business. Okay. Uh, there's also another one called the Employee Retention Credit. Uh, the same deal, we were too late. Uh, our closing was post-pandemic, so none of that stuff applied. Okay. The idea for those you didn't know was uh, um, the pandemic relief money. They gave every business whatever you asked for, pretty much, and there was nothing I can tell you firsthand that they asked for, other than say whatever you make, we'll send you a check. <laughs> so that there was a lot of money for that. All right, so um, you've you've evaluated the business. You went and got your SBA. What was the seller note about again? Uh, the seller note was, it made it more financeable, so it was friendlier for the bank because. Of puts them in a better loan to value. Uh, and also it gave me security if anything was wrong after I bought it. Say, you know, maybe the forklift that works in the shop instantly broke down, or maybe the accounts receivable that re they reported really wasn't all there. Uh, and then I could negotiate back and take that off the seller now. Okay, here's the million dollar question. What did you know about cabinet business before you bought this? Uh, um, well, I do have a construction background, so I know what cabinets are, uh, <laughs> and I've used a table saw, and uh, that, that's kind of about it. <laughs> okay. All right. So... This, this is some more work that the, the, the cabinet business does, but speak to this slide, Jeff. Okay, so um, what, uh, what I was saying about a multiplier of profits, profits are calculated by what's called EBITDA, that's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, that's an accounting term. Uh, there's a couple variations of that, there's EBIT, uh, and there's, um, I think there's one without depreciation as well. Uh, so what you do is you take that figure on the PL, you multiply that by one to five, and you come up with the value of the business. Okay. Based on comps. So where's the profit? Profits in several centers. Uh, that picture is more of the work they've done. Uh, profits in cash flow. Uh, as I mentioned, that if you took the EBITDA multiplier and you viewed it as a cap rate, you would be like 15, 20, 25% cap rates. So there's really good cash flow in these deals. Uh, um, then it's also buying it right. This guy was in trouble. He needed somebody to bail him out. And he was willing to take 50 cents on the dollar. Uh, 
Uh, same as buying a fix and flip. You buy it for 70% minus repairs. Uh, you make your money when you buy. Um, and then there's growth. Uh, the more you grow it, not only are you increasing cash flow and you're increasing stability, but you're increasing the multiplier as well. Okay, so any questions? <laughs> Andrew Sebro here. Uh, two questions. When you um, got into this deal, what's the competition like? You said you were getting a huge deal on it. Weren't other people then aware of that? And, you know, were you, were you having to compete against a lot of other um, buyers? And my second part is, he already touched on it, but a little more in depth, what did you do for the business side to raise uh, revenue and operate it? Did you keep the operation, pretty much the business intact as far as personnel and executive and everything? It seems like you've made a turnaround and in increasing profit and revenue pretty quickly. Okay, um, sorry, good. the first question again was? Competition. Competition, okay, there was, uh, we were told there was 16 offers on the business. I don't know if I believe that because every time you talk to a broker, an agent, they tell you, oh, it's multiple offer situation. Well, okay, maybe, but he seemed real interested in accepting my offer. Uh, I think I was probably the right blend of, of price and terms. Uh, other people obviously were offering, but they didn't have the, the strength to buy. And then um, there were some others that were literally cash buyers, but they were paying pennies and it wouldn't even cover the debt. So that's how we got the deal. Uh, and then as far as uh, changing things out, um, we pretty much, I switched out the executive team. Uh, but everybody else was left the same. The seller became our head salesman and he runs the sales team. All those people are the same. Uh, a couple of office people just rotated on us because that just happens in business. Um, but the CEO is a quasi partner of mine. Other questions? Over there. You got them, Joe? Okay. Why did you choose a, a recourse loan in, instead of a non-recourse? Did you have an option? I did not have an option. Okay. <laughs> if you have an option, normally you'd, you'd go with the not. Right there. You said in doing your comps for the business, you look to see what how what business is sold for. Where do you get that information? Uh, you can get it from business brokers. Uh, you can get it from sites like bizbuysell or bizquest.com. Um, and there's some other ser services that you can get business comps from. Uh, the SBA is a great source of that. Uh, and there are business appraisers out there that you can pull a little information out of them to see, you know, this size business in that industry what's the multiplier we should expect. Mm. Question. Um, if the business will cease to exist once you purchase the property, and you're going to have to do all kinds of addition and remodel, how do you value that? Sorry, how do I value so, the... So if the business that's currently there, not, not yours, but if you're evaluating a property and the business will cease to exist because it's a sole proprietor and they're retiring and leaving and the business will cease to be there, how would you value that property? I, I would value that as an empty commercial property. So that would be more of a square foot valuation. Just land value. And, and then if you were getting the business equipment, I would value it at liquidation value. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Oh. You say you took it over in uh, July. Uh, did you continue on with the same uh, like LLC or whatever, or did you start a new company altogether that just owned that, that as far as tax purposes also? 
So there's two ways to do it. You can do it as a stock sale and you can do it as an asset sale. Uh, I stayed away from a stock sale because in a stock sale, everything the past company did, I would be liable for. Uh, so we did it as an asset sale. I created a new corporation or LLC. Uh, I created an LLC to take the real estate and I created a, a C corporation to take the business. Excellent question, interesting answer. Yep. Um, back to the lending perspective, like you said that you tried two different lenders and what was the reasons why they chose not to proceed with your deal? Um, I actually tried six different lenders. Um, I tried one, then I tried another, and then I tried four simultaneously. Uh, and it wasn't that they weren't proceeding, it was just that the business in its state of being on the edge of bankruptcy, plus buying the real estate, plus the issues with the pandemic and everything that was going on, plus the issues of the 500 pages of SBA regulations on loans made it a big Rubik's cube for the lenders to solve. So uh, a lot of them were trying, but they just couldn't figure out how to make this deal fit into the SBA regulations. And one of the lenders figured out how to structure the deal to make it fit those SBA regulations. And that was the one we went with. So so in, in that situation, it's more predicated on the actual business as opposed to yourself, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, there, there is a little bit of myself involved in it, like personal credit was checked, personal history going back to eight age 18 or whatever, uh, I mean, they go, they check everything. Um, they wanted to know all my assets, they appraised my other rental properties, uh, but uh, I'd say two thirds of the weight was carried by the potential of the business. All right, I think we got time for one more question and then we need to make sure we get on to the next one. Do you have one? So apologies if you've already said this, but what's your exit strategy? Uh, we're growing the business um, and we plan to acquire other businesses in related fields and then merge all of those businesses together and sell it as a package. That's called an agglomeration and uh, by it's the fastest way to grow. And uh, by doing so, we're creating a much higher multiplier very quickly. What was that word one more time? Agglomeration. Agglomeration. How many of y'all knew that word? <laughs> Didn't think so. Awesome. Can I we get a Jeff, great? Thank you so much yeah, for coming great up. Round of applause. Our next presenter is a longtime member of CFRI, and they're willing to share an old story about why a deal didn't go so well. Hunter Pascal, coming up. Round of applause for Hunter. Okay, so tell, tell, tell a group about yourself, who you are, and how long you've been part of CFRI. Okay, uh, I was just looking at the CFRI estimated 1989. Okay. Established, not estimated. It's established. <laughs> I'm a high school dropout, sorry. Um, I, I started, I joined CFRI in 1996. No okay. when I joined CFRI. So I've been around and involved with CFRI for quite some time. So I know a few people here, or I don't know a lot of people. So that's, that's always good. Okay, for the learning purposes of this group, tell us what went wrong with this deal. Tell us what you, um, why you bought it. Where it's located and that good stuff. Okay, so this is called Dud of the Month. I'm glad you changed that. Thank you. Because yeah. I was talking they to my keep assistant. Me on my toes. I was call, talking to my assistant. So uh, this particular property came in a package of deals. There was like 12 deals. I forgot to tell you that part. I forgot that part because okay. it's been such long ago. And to be honest with you, this is something I've never shared before. So this is kind of emotional. <laughs> hey guys. So when you say Dud of the Month. 
means you probably didn't make any money, right? I used to do deals with them all. <laughs> a lot, but you know, anyway. So this particular deal came with a package deal and this investor back in 2004, 2006, right? When everybody could just blow on the blow on the mirror and they could get a loan, right? So this guy had loans all across many states and he started in Texas. This particular property was in Alabama. And it was in Birmingham, Alabama, to be exact. And uh, so uh, he had a lot of financial problems like the gentleman was talking about earlier. Uh, that's, the, that's the most motivated seller you can find. And this motivated seller had 12 properties and they're all in foreclosure. So uh, I like distressed properties. I like homeowners that need to sell, not want to sell. So we took on the whole package. I said, the only way I'm gonna do is if we take on the whole package. 2006, long time ago, right? And uh, so we bought the property. We had to negotiate with the bank to get this deal. It's called a short sale. So unfortunately, we don't have the notes on this because it was so long ago. And we had a couple of hard drive crashes in the office since then. So that you know, kind of upset me a little bit because I like to video everything and record everything and keep everything. And my wife throws it away. But anyway, tell, tell everybody who doesn't know what a short sale is. Oh, okay. So short sale is where uh, you have a loan on a property uh, and the, the homeowner can't pay the mortgage. So they have a mortgage on a property at 200000 I'll use those numbers to keep everybody in the game. And, and $200,000 and uh, the, the homeowner can't pay that mortgage. Now, whether the, the value of the property is high or low, higher than the mortgage or lower, there's always room for negotiations. So in today's market, there's a lot of equity in properties. But back in here, everybody was buying us hot and you know there wasn't a lot, especially in 08. If everybody who's been around since 08, you know about the crash. So uh, if you're not making your mortgage payments or if you miss one payment, actually, you're actually in default. Is that right? And one payment, one day, you're in default. But it takes the bank sometimes to catch up to that and give you notes and give you letters and all these things and try to give you, a, uh, try to get you to catch up and, and catch the mortgages up. So you typically, typically, uh, the short sale is where a company comes in and negotiates for the seller on behalf of the seller with the bank to reduce that debt and liquidate the property. And that's what a short sale is. So the bank will, you, you uh, communicate with the bank, uh, a lot of communication, a lot of experience and time, but you find out what they'll accept for that asset, that non-performing asset that they have, which they need to get rid of because it uh, allows them, uh, doesn't allow them to loan other money. They have to keep enough in reserve to cover bad assets or bad loans. So the short is, and matter of fact, if you really want to know what it is, you all want to get the movie, The Big Short. Big short. Yeah. That will explain what happened in 2008. It's called The Big Short. It's a very good movie. It's pretty, pretty kind of real to the numbers and the deal. So, so basically, the $200,000 loan, the value of the property may be $200,000 but it's behind the pay, the homeowner's not paying. So the value, so the, the, the debt keeps rising and the value of the property and actually the debt rises, the, the, it lowers, not today's market, but uh, so you get the property for less than what is owed. You might buy it for 150 or it was owed 200. So that's called a short, short sale. And that means the homeowner, uh, walks away from the property and there are consequences of a short sale by the way so a homeowner a lender can come after a homeowner for two different things and come after him for a tax uh, 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 1099 which is 10 1099 cancellation of debt which is good through 2025 is the new new uh, guidelines and um, the other one is a de deficiency so whatever so if the mortgage is 200,000 and they sell the house for 150 there's a $50,000 deficiency and that deficiency can attach to any other property the person may own or it may just come into a, a form of a note that they the bank may ask them to sign which you should never do that if anybody ever gets that say heck no or a hard hell no is what you should say and uh 
So, and they can't force you to sign it, but can they come after you? Yes, but it's, it's, it's easy to get rid of. But that's, that's the two things that are, that are pretty scary in a short sale. Okay. So tell us what was the original plan here okay. on this property. So, and there's some other things that I we didn't give you. So this property was rented, if you can believe it or not. It's actually some pretty good pictures right there. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have inside pictures after that tenants had vacated. So when we bought this property, it was actually being rented for uh, $1,700 a month. And there was four imagine. families there, right? And there was four families. This is a four unit. It's a fourplex. So there's there's a one bedroom, one bath, two places, and two bedroom, one bath. So it was nine hundred for two of them and eight hundred for the other one. Seventeen hundred bucks a month. That was coming in while we were doing the negotiations with the bank. And while we were trying to communicate with the management company, who was definitely taking advantage of the seller, you know, that we didn't know at the point, at the moment, but that's what was happening. So we purchased this property, and, and uh, unfortunately, I don't know what it was valued at or what was owed on the property, because I love to tell those stories. I mean, it could have been, it could have been 150, you know, but it was more than 60 grand. And uh, I mean, we purchased the property, the bank settled it at $60,000 uh, on this short. Repair value was, you know, the R after repair value in today's industry was 200 grand in that time, not today, but at that time. And we estimated by pictures, videos, contractors, other contractors, other contractors, it was $60,000 in repairs. And I said, wow, it just didn't seem like that when we started on this deal. That was that because we had four families living here. So the idea was to keep it rented and collect the rent. Well, we were getting $1,700 worth of income, but we were only getting an $800 check from the management company. I said, something's really got to be wrong here. So I started asking questions about this, and they're saying this had to be fixed, this and that and that. So it went on for about three months. And I said, you know, I guess I'm going to have to come up there. And this is Alabama. I'm in Florida. I've been in my, all my life in Florida. And um, I said, wow, something's just very wrong. I'm not very smart and educated in math, but this doesn't look right. And, and uh, so, so I started making them send me in voices and sending me all this stuff and then next thing you know I get a call from one of the tenants somehow I got my number or number and said hey everybody's moving out I said what they go yeah everybody's moving out so the management company removed them and put them in somebody else's property they could rip them off and left me with a vacant property and I'm in Florida and I don't buy and another thing don't buy real estate outside of 50 miles if you've never bought one don't just don't do it it's just not worth it it's a pain in the ass and, and you're going to get taken advantage of, especially if you're new, just don't do it. You know, it's just not worth it. So I learned a bunch of lessons here. What was that? Do not buy real estate. Is it for your husband? Oh, okay. Uh, do not buy real estate. Yes, okay. If you're on bigger pockets and you're on all those TV, all that stuff, please, please, please. If you don't have somebody that you really, really know and can trust, like Rob Arnold, you know, or something like that, you know, or John Bolton, uh, you just you just don't want to do these things. And, and I learned the hard way, but I was doing, I was going, there was doing so much going on in 2006, right, for us. I mean, I've been an investor since 1996, full time. And uh, so when we bought this, I said, oh, I can handle this. You know, big guns can handle this. So I never actually went to the property. I've never, this, is the, this is the only pictures I've seen of this property, except for the videos of the ceilings falling in and the, the copper being stripped out of the walls and uh, what else? The plumbing being gone and all, I mean, just everything missing. I go, wow, that happened that quick. So anyway, I started getting... Um, Okay, so I need a roof, electric, plumbing, re I mean, just everything at this point. I was saying, wow, this, this $60,000 repair probably went to 120, maybe something like that. But I was just so busy doing other things. And, and, and my wife kept saying, sell this damn thing, sell this damn thing. I said, no, if we sell it, I know she goes, you're losing your ass, you're losing your ass. I says, no, we're not, we haven't sold it yet. <laughs> It isn't sold. I still, we still have the money in this thing. So that went on for years. I'm talking like 14 years. Right? 
14 years, I never went and saw this property because I was so disgusted with the whole fact. And plus we were doing other deals, right? We were doing deals at home where we could make money, you know? And so I forgot about Alabama. And, and so then I started getting code enforcement letters because of this. Is there another slide or no. we don't get it? Okay, well this, is, okay, so after the code enforcement letters, I had to hire people to mow the grass and clean it up and they start sending me these trees growing in my property. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know? So I kind of really got more disgusted and more disgusted and I think I paid this guy $700 to go cut this place every three or four years, whatever it was. The, the, the holding costs is a little off. We made a mistake, so yeah. talk, talk to that. Yeah, so let me touch on the holding costs. So, um, you, you, say, had, you know, you Maintenance and the taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was talking about that. So, I mean, he, he said you had taxes and insurance. I said, why would I insure that? I only paid 50 grand for it. So, I didn't have any insurance. So, I did get that. But he has, you had some hold, you had some taxes. I said, yeah, tax was only 250 a year or 300, whatever it was. It was nothing. And, and I didn't pay him until I had to, you know, the three years or whatever it was. So, the 1800 was probably the mowing, not the taxes. So, if you figure $300 a year for 14 years, years, whatever it was, that's what the tax, so that's the cost, so I did really lose my ass, didn't I? Um, so, uh, so with that being said, I started getting these code enforcement violations again, uh, so I'm probably never going to go see this property because it's out of state, it's in Alabama, I mean, I'm, my, my sister's an Alabama fan, I'm not, but, you know, roll tide, right, so, uh, I started getting these letters and these letters, and I always buy everything in a land trust. I always use trust. I've always, always had. When I first learned about land trust, I thought it was so amazing, all the benefits and all the different things you can do with land trust. So it took a while for the county to find me or whatever. And I started getting these really nasty letters and things and, and all these code enforcement violations. And then the first one of the first pictures that showed a pillar was falling. Well, the other pillar fell afterwards. One of those pillars at the roof in the front there. And I said, wow, I said, so I looked at my assistant. And I said, you know what? I'm really tired of this property. And my wife was right. We're going to lose our ass on this property. So I said, let's deed it to the county. She said, what? I said, yeah, we're going to take that, that, that land trust. And we're just going to deed it to the people who are complaining to us. And she goes, now let me ask you, how many guys drive for dollars? Because this is an ideal driving for dollars property. Clearly, you didn't get any letters to sell it. You know, back then, we did not get a lot of letters, but I did. We did work on some contracts. So I didn't mention that. There was some interest. We did market it, you know, the best we could. It was for the internet, right? <laughs> So we marketed the best we could, and we did what we best we could out of state. Again, don't buy out of state if you're new. And uh, so, you know, it was just hard to. I mean, I was doing, I was doing other finance. Give me a thousand down, I'll take a thousand. Two hundred dollars a month, yeah, I'll take that. I'll take whatever you can give me. Please buy this thing. And I had a lady from Georgia that was going to buy it one time for seventy-five thousand dollars. Yeah. And uh, she made the trip and looked at it and everything. So that's what I said. Wow, let's do it. And I'm, over, I'm all in for this, you know. She just never pulled the trigger. Yeah, I know. So the moral of the story, don't buy out of town. Uh, be careful. If you're new. If you're yeah. new. Yeah, if you're new. I mean, if you're not new, I mean, we, we buy out of town now. But I have boots on the ground, so that's what. And if you do buy out of town, make sure you got good people boots on the ground if you can't go. I mean. That's you got to have management you can trust because, um, as Hunter stated, management companies that know you're out of town and don't know what you're doing will take advantage of you. They'll mark up the invoices. They'll tell you stuff is broken. It's not broken and fix it anyway and give you an invoice and ask me how I know. OK, so. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, that's it, man. So we gave it back to the code enforcement. So the, the, the real good part of this whole thing was when I deeded it back to the county, something happened. So there's called what's called a quiet title. So that's what somebody had to do. I don't know who was doing it, but I got a call from an attorney said, hey, your name's all over this thing. Would you please sign it? And I said, yes, yeah, send $500 to this account and I'll sign it. Sure enough, they sent five hundred dollars to me. Uh, this is like twenty nineteen, twenty twenty. 
So they sent me $500. I signed it. Another six or seven months later, they said, hey, we got to have another signature. I said, you know the drill. Send me $500. I'll sign it. <laughs> and that's what he did. So I did get $1,000, and I handed that to my wife. <laughs> So good, give a round of applause for Hunter. And questions, you got, hang around. They might have some questions. Oh, applause, I thought I was leaving. Thank you, yeah, we, questions. We, got, we got time for maybe one or two questions, but do me a favor and give Hunter one more round of applause because not everybody will get up here and talk about stuff like that. We don't, yeah. we don't all have deals like that, but when you do, it's not one of those that you go, hey, let me show this to everybody. <laughs> so we really appreciate Hunter doing that. Yeah, this is the first time, actually, so this can't not go on the internet or none of that, so no <laughs> video. <laughs> yeah, right, that's on Zoom. Any questions? Any questions? we got time for one or two if you've got them. Cool. Answer all the questions. Joe's got you right over there. Yep. Hey, you said this was part of a package deal. How did the other properties oh, do? Very good question. Awesome. So, more out-of-state properties. Uh, in 2006, we probably had done, I don't know, maybe 100 short sales. So we did get some other ones in Texas done. Texas is quick turn state, so they foreclosed pretty quick. So I think we got one other deal that we did out of the whole 12 package because it was just so hard to keep track of this guy and get this seller because you have to have the seller on board the whole time through the short sale process. And he was so beat up and just all over the place and he'd been lied to and he was a new investor. I mean, he went out there and he used his credit and said, hey, go buy all the properties you can buy. If you can get a loan, go buy it. And that's what he did. And he lost everything. And it's sad, but no, we didn't make a ton of money. We probably didn't make all the 12 packages it was just it was just so hard so tough so we just didn't do much with them so it was a learn, learning lesson bring it back foster where were you at <laughs> how did you miss that question foster he answered that that question don't count all right we got time for one more if you guys have one more question oh freddie short so there <laughs> Need to be. It's another strategy. All right, another round of applause for Hunter, please. All right. Thank you guys for um, listening. Um, the whole idea is that you learn something from these deals and duds. And um, tomorrow night, commercial real estate at the office. Go online, sign up. Yours truly is the host. All right, man. Let's have another right there. Man, the remote. Come on, big round of applause. Come on. There, yeah, there you go. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good deal. Okay. Well, let's see here. Uh, again, if you have a dealer at Dud, the way that we find out about these things, the way that Phil is able to do this is people contact him and say, hey, I have this dealer, this Dud that I, I can help you out with. And remember, this is very, very helpful for our entire audience. So that we're not looking to shame anybody or anything like that. We're looking to share information. This is all about networking and education. And the way we do that is by having people present those deals and does so again thank you to both jeff and hunter and phil for presenting those all right if you have not already you're going to get a break here in just a moment we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to visit our business vendors who if you didn't realize it are back at the business vendor tables these are the vendors that are here tonight we want to say a big thank you to them because without our business members we would not have half of the stuff that we do to offer everyone now just out of curiosity how many people here are not a member of CFRI. I'd like you to stand up. We're going to give you guys a round of applause. If you're not a member of CFRI, please stand up. Outstanding. Let's give these people a round of applause. They have already taken a first step and stay standing for just a moment because what I want you to do is I would like you to follow this lovely lady in red, Miss Mari Lynch. She's going to give you a quick presentation so you can learn how to make the most out of that first step that you've taken. And we will be back in here in 10 minutes. So everybody else, you have a 10 minute break. We'll start back at seven. And those of you that were just standing, please follow Mari and she'll give you a quick presentation so that you don't so that you get what you want in life and you're not constantly being run over or you're regretting decisions that you've made 
And um, anything else? Um, contact information. Okay. If you oh, contact it. information. My number is 407-492-3212. And I firmly believe in owning rentals as a wonderful way to build wealth. Um, am I doing it wrong? <laughs> Local, local, and that's the other within thing. fifty miles. John right? Schaub said twenty minutes. Oh, even better. Twenty minutes within your, yeah. you know, where you live, or maybe your office. If you have an office somewhere, mm -hmm. you should have your rentals within twenty minutes. That's my philosophy. Now we'll probably hear different philosophies here tonight. And again, a lot of different ways to do this real estate animal. And what you just need to do is find out what works for you, what works within your value system, what works within your risk level. And um, another good tip that I heard was, this is going to sound weird, but I swear it's true. The lowest common denominator of human that you can deal with, and that's where you'll make the most money. Interesting way to put that. I don't think I've heard it said that quite that way. That's this was years good. ago. We had a little guy. He was probably five foot five. And he went around the numbered streets in Orlando, 32805. And he carried a weapon on him and he collected rents every Friday night. I don't want to do that in my life. I want to be with my family on Friday nights. So, but that's, it works for him. So it's not for me to say that what he's doing is wrong. It's just what works for you. I was just coming to down here, I guess. <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask you guys to continue introducing yourselves while we check on an AV problem. So if you kick that off next. Testing, testing. This AV problem works. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, so I'm Maria, and um, you might be able to see my shirt. It says Blue Viking Property. So the reason it says Blue Viking is because I'm a Blue Viking. I came from Sweden. I'm an immigrant. Um, I moved here when I was nine years old. And uh, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, but I managed to put myself through college and um, I don't know how many old timers we have here who remember Carlton Sheets. Anybody remember? There's one. Okay. All right. We got a few in here. So um, when you're in college, you're up late at night a lot studying and you just have that TV droning in the background. And sure enough, one of those um, Carlton Sheets, you know, sales guru courses came on and I decided instead of buying school books that semester, because I was down to my last dollar, I foregoed the books and I bought the Carlton Sheets course instead. <laughs> and I ended up buying my first property before I graduated college. So um, I couldn't afford school books, but I was able to buy a 2,000 square foot, four bedroom, two bath, beautiful home, no money down on a lease option. I'm like, I like this real estate stuff. So that's kind of how I got hooked. And I've been buying properties ever since. Um, I mean, that's only been like a year or two. I just got out of college. <laughs> um, but anyway, so so yeah, I've been doing it for, for quite a while. And um, unlike Connie, who got proper schooling in residential management, um, I just went to the school of hard knocks and made all the mistakes. So I'm up here to fill that those questions, all the mistakes. I've, I've done all of those. So that's that's it. Um, best way to contact me is to, um, to connect with me on Facebook. Uh, DM me if you have questions. That's probably the easiest way i tend to be on there quite a lot or we go to my website for bluevikingproperties.com and uh, my email's on there good evening my name is tim davis and um, i've been a cfri member since 2014 i think um, Oh, like Maria, I bought my first rental property when I was 18 years old. I've been buying and selling ever since then. Um, currently, I own a couple of real estate offices, and uh, between those two real estate offices, we manage a little over 500 properties. So we do collect a lot of rent. We do have a lot of experience in tenant management that's really what what you manage is the tenants and, um, so and i do lead the uh, landlording focus group so if if you um, want to learn a little bit more about landlording on a, a monthly basis we, we have a monthly meeting called the landlording focus group however i won't be there for the next two months 
I'm going to be on vacation for a couple of months. And uh, Connie will be filling in for me on the first month. And then uh, I got to get somebody else for the, the second one. But well, that's a little bit about me. Oh, phone number uh, 407. 624-4000, extension 102. And I will call you back if you call and have to leave a message. I will call you back. I do help um, all CFRI members with uh, any kind of landlording questions that you might have, even if you're not one of my customers uh, as a, as a uh, landlord, I will help you. So you can call me anytime. Hi guys, my name is uh, Chris Gatley. As you can see, I'm from all oh, here. I'm across from the other side of the pond, and I'm Connie's youngest son. So, as we go forward, uh, I got into landlording uh, mostly about 20, 25 years ago. But my background is I work for uh, tour operators. Tour operators, sim uh, something similar to Apple Vacations. So uh, we used to, me and my team used to go out and contract hotel rooms, aircrafts, uh, ships. We're also in, in Florida, especially all under the Kissimmee area. 30 years ago, we used to contract short-term rentals. So we were well ahead of Airbnb. So we could contract 100, 200 villas a night and then uh, sell them through our tour programs in the UK and Germany. Germany and the UK guests would come out for seven or 14 nights. So what I did then, I, I decided that we would buy one or two of these uh, short-term rentals where we could rent them to the UK market. And at the time, my wife and I, we weren't married, so we were renting. So we'd already bought two of these properties and they were going quite well, but a lot of the people used to say, well, you know, or they try and sell you these properties and they say, well, you can do 52 weeks a year. You just can't possibly do two, 52 weeks a year. And I was in the business, we could only ever do about 46 weeks. And when you try and do back to back. So I decided, should we buy another one? And my wife says, well, how about we try and buy a house what we can live in? Because we're still renting. Ooh, I didn't think of that one. So that's what we did. So then we sold those and I got into long-term rentals. And the reason why I got into long to buying properties for long-term rentals is that I didn't believe in four or what we didn't know what four or one case really with pensions and everything. And I wanted something where I could hold touch and I could see what was going on with it. So that's how we got into the long-term rentals. And the other thing is like Tim, if I want to go away for two or three months a year, then we can do. And these properties sort themselves out. So it was one, uh, we just decided to have kids. And again, I thought, okay, I didn't want to travel the world to the tour operating. And the best way for me to do that was uh, go with um, the short, uh, sorry, the long term rentals. And I must say, it's been fantastic. It really has, like, you know. So, look, I don't have a website, I'm not on social media. I do live, I am here. Uh, but if anybody needs to touch me, that, uh, speak to me. My number is 407 230. 5731. Failing that, you can call 911 and ask for Tim. Beautiful. Thank you, everybody, for doing that. I do appreciate it. And we will now make sure that everybody, again, remembers the reason that you're hearing a little bit about this is because not only are you going to learn some cool stuff tonight, but we have a Landlording Academy coming up on when? Friday the 13th. That was so good for my audience. Did you hear that? I heard it. Let's try that again. What day is this Landlording Academy? Oh, okay, I'm kind of like Chris, you are here. All right, good. <laughs> Just making sure. All right, so let's see if we can find out some more interesting details. And again, like I said, we'll have a few minutes to do Q&A, so be thinking about what questions you might want to know the answers to. Thank you to our guests for uh, introducing themselves. Now, one of the things that I think is probably um, on a lot of people's minds, maybe everybody's minds, is we're seeing a lot going on in the current environment with inflation 
inflation and the rising costs and whatnot. So one of the things that I'm very curious about and to get your take on is what's happening with rents. Uh, and you can comment from the, pers per the perspective of, you know, are you able to raise them? Are you, are you able to raise them? How's that going? And maybe kind of along with that, what's your method? How do you, how do you inform people that and how do you collect on that? It's kind of a two-part question, but yeah, might as well go ahead, kind of sure. Yeah, I'll start there. Okay, we have two recent examples of this. We are um, guilty of letting people live in our house for a long time and not really raising the rent much, like $15 a year, whatever. And so we had two recent renters. I won't go into the background details, but they were kind of being a pain in the neck, costing us money and, and kind of questionable. So we sent them one of the Harry Heist term, um, pages. I don't know if you guys have heard of Harry Heist. He's an attorney, evict.com. And one of his forms is a 30-day notice that you're not going to renew your lease. But if you want to renew your lease, you can pay this much. And I raised the rent $300, or we raised the rent. When I say I, I mean we. Um, we raised the rent $300. I said, send me a picture of this when you sign it and then mail it back to me. I posted it on the door. I got pictures of it in 24 hours. So we don't have a rental crisis going on right now. When somebody's willing to, to take a $300 raise in rent, and th one of the persons lived there like three, these people lived there three to five years. So it's not like it's gone up, you know, $1,500. So, you know, we, we just heard today, Rob and I were at the Orange County um, Commission meeting, and the people that are in support of rent stabilization, as they're calling it, in other words, rent control, are trying to, you know, sing this really sad song about how oppressed people are and how much they can't afford their rent, but I have two random selections. One was in Seminole County, one was in Brevard County, that when they were being a pain in my side, I said, okay, if you want to be a pain, one was destroying refrigerators, so there was a very legit expense going on. We had been through three refrigerators in like three years, and we don't have that problem in our other units. They were destroying them. So when we raise the rent $300 and, and we get a, a signed piece of paper the next day that they're willing to pay more in rent, we are not having a rental crisis because if I was charging too much rent, they would have moved, they would have taken the notice and gone somewhere else. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. If that, I mean, if they can turn it around that fast, they're ready to pay it, no doubt. Well, and, and or I also included a picture of the Zillow page showing what the Zestimate rent for our house house was and ours was still a little bit under the Zestimate rent which is you know an algorithm of an average rents in that area for that many bedrooms and baths. A great strategy love it yeah all right Maria. Yeah so similar um, I also had a couple of long-term tenants that um, you know we had just raised them maybe a little more aggressive than that but still uh, not quite to market I didn't realize just how fast the market had skyrocketed so um, I, I went to terminate a lease on somebody and, and I liked them. They were good enough renters, but I realized I was like $450 below market rent. And I was not about to say, hey, guys, I'm upping your rent 450 bucks. So I was just honest with them. I said, you know, we're going we're gonna to renovate the whole property. It's kind of old looking. And then we're going to rent back out at market rents because, you know, we feel like we're losing a lot of money and our insurance and everything else is going up. And I, I told them all our costs, whatever. And they said they understood and they would start looking for a place. And then they called me just a few days later and they said, what is that market rent? And I told them and they said, well, we'd like to stay. And if you'll allow us to do that, you don't have to renovate the house. All we ask for is a new fridge, There's something about fridges. <laughs> So, so, I mean, I got that, that rental increase without any expenses of renovations. And um, just last year, we bought a, um, a eight unit apartment complex in Bradenton with the plan of going in and fully gutting and renovating all of them to bring the rents up because other rents around there were much higher. And then when it came time, you know, we had our first vacancy, the, land, the um, property manager of that property said, let's just test the waters and put it at that rent without the renovations and see what happens. And they end up having people compete for the unit to where we end up getting $150 more than we had hoped to get 
uh, after renovations. So, and we had planned on doing $12,000 worth of renovations per unit. So, yeah, I, I think there's plenty of headway there. I did not do the renovations. Wow. <laughs> All right. Tim, let's hear your version of that. Interesting. So, um, so as you can imagine, we we turn a lot of property with 500 plus uh, rentals. We probably are renting 10 to 10 to 12 new units every month, and a lot of people stay for a long time. So we're not turning every unit, but we work for probably 200, 200 to 250 different owners across those two offices, and our. Our goal is to bring the highest rate of return to, to the owners that we work for as we possibly can. So we're very, um, very tuned in to what is going on in the market. We, we do a lot of research, do a lot of study, and we are, are looking at the market rents out there right now and, and um, you know, doing the best we can for our owners. And on average, we're, we're raising rents about 30 to 40 percent. And, and it's not something that we're making up because we're doing the research and we're actually seeing what the rest of the people are, are doing out there. A $300 rent increase is not uncommon right now. And it's very interesting because uh, we're seeing the same thing where people are, are, they get all bent out of shape and they're saying, well, we're not going to stay here. We're going to leave. And a couple of days later, you hear a phone call. Um, I think we'll stay because they're, they're going out there. They're testing the market. They're seeing what's out there. And there's, there's very little out there to rent. Um, even though we might turn 10 to 12 units a month, we only have maybe if you look at our website right now you might find two and we won't be there tomorrow so that is that is a, a big problem right now and and the interesting thing about this is i don't know how sustainable it is so it'll be very interesting to see what happens you know six months eight months down the road when these new rents are kicking in and and um, there's a hiccup in somebody's uh, job or, or something like that it'd be interesting to see what happens but that's what we're seeing right now chris and uh with, with me we've always put um, a rent increase in between three and five percent and i call it a nuisance payment so 30 40 50 dollars you normally got get, not going to move and especially in today's market so that's what we've always done but just lately we have been behind so a lot of my tenants were there for a long time and two or three of them over the last two years no four of them have left and they would need like 10 or 12 years so I'll give you an idea one house we've got uh, which has just turned over is so remember it's always gone three to five percent uh, they were there for 10 years anyway from two years ago yeah two years ago it went from 1500 and it's just been rented now for 1950 we just had another one what went out now they were only there for two years and that house we put it on the market uh two weeks ago and within two hours it had gone and that's increased by 400 and in one we have uh, a duplex in Leesburg, a 3-2. That one, when we took them over, they were 750. That one just went within 24 hours, and those that rent now is 1250. So, you know, as and we always send the letter out. I send it out in February after Christmas and everything else. So we give the people say 30 to 60 days, and majority of people stay. So and it, it is like with me. There's, so there's just me and my wife it's word of mouth and we either get somebody else who the family knows or whatever but again we're very strict you know if you are late sorry you get to charge $75 and $10 a day so you know but if you've got a problem those that the problem is sorted out so yeah so we've always been strict on the rent increases but it's going great so you know you're looking at I don't know three four five thousand extra on some of these houses than that 
Yeah, some quick math there. If you went from 750 to 1250, that's like a 40% increase. I mean, that's that's incredible. So um, I, we never, yeah. we only ever do the three to five percent. So when you've moved out, mm -hmm. that's when we can become up just a little bit below market rents. And and how I run the business is that if there was something disastrous went on, we could allow any of our rents to go below 20%. We could reduce them 20% and we would still cash flow. Makes sense. Yeah, Connie, did you have something now? One thing is that um, your 3% reminded me that recently in the couple, last couple months, Tom has changed our lease so that um, it's written in the lease that the, the lease, the rents will go up every year 3%. It's a great standard way to do it. And if it's in the lease, they're, they're already aware. Right. And the other thing I wanted to point out to people who may not own properties for rentals is that each of us have a little different perspective. And like Tim is talking about his as a property management business, and he already looks at it as an asset protection, asset management business. And like I remember going to Harry Heist one year, and he was talking to us saying, you're not property managers your asset managers. Yep. So you'll hear slightly different things from Tim than you will from us if we are rent managing our own properties. And it's not necessarily right or wrong. It's just going to be a little bit different, you know, blend. Uh, that, that makes complete sense. Um, Chris, you made a really interesting point that I wanted to kind of capitalize on, and we'll work from you back this way on this one. You were talking about uh, the tenants themselves and who's in there. So what's what's your process for making sure that whoever you are going to put in someplace to select the right tenant? What, what's the strategy there? A lot of it is sort of like gut feeling, but I, um, I still, if you will, meet an interview with every single tenant who's going in. Now, just lately, what will happen that we've allowed them to go in and look at the properties themselves, put a key on, we tell them it's the, the videos are going. And then when we come down to it, then we have to do a background check and everything else. Uh, a, few year, <laughs> a few years ago, we advertised one property and this uh, really nice, like big black lady, she come on a Sunday morning to look at it. And uh, she says like she got a a really big colorful dress big hat and whatnot and she says oh yeah i like this one and i says well we do have another one down the road that has a swimming pool as well so would you like to look at that so yeah she has looked at that she says no no i want that one there i says all right then so we do background checks i says and uh, credit checks now i understand that a lot of people's credit hasn't been the best so we'll work with you if that isn't the best then we'll work with you on a bigger deposit yeah, okay. She says, what's this background check? I said, well, we have to have the background check. And if if you, if you it doesn't come back as you're a mass murderer, then we can maybe able to go forward. She says, oh, she says, well, I've been done for larceny. Now, obviously, I'm a Brit. I hadn't got a clue what this larceny meant. And she looked at my eyes and she says, oh, I says, oh, I don't know what larceny is. She says, shoplifting. She says, honey, a lot of. It. So I said to us, well, I'm sorry, this house won't work for you because there's brand new appliances in there and we need to for the next one. So what I'm saying is that well, we into everybody. I tell them the truth, as he says, like, you know, that say with the three to five percent, your rent will go up every year, but you can trust what we say. If you lie to me on the application, then call it today because we just don't do with lying. So, you know, and it, word gets around to say, you know, I don't have a website or anything else. So it's a good feeling. Mine's quite big. But again, you can't, you can't can't get it right every time, but as luck happens, it happens in the 20 years I've been doing it, I haven't had an eviction. I've been close to it and I've talked them out to things because I believe what we do, we salespeople. And like, you know, and people buy from who they like. So that's how I do. Excellent. Tim, how about you? It's funny you, you would say that, Chris, because I 
when I, when I first did this, I, I didn't have a lot of experience. When I first started the property management company, we didn't have a lot of experience. And so we did the background check and the credit check and all the checks that everybody does. And then I would sit around with, well, I had an assistant and we would sit around and we look at each other and we go, well, do you like them? <laughs> And as we were doing that one day, I thought to myself, this isn't going to be scalable. I can't sit around and do this all the time. So, so what we did, and I'm glad you asked the question, because we came up with a, with a score sheet. Okay, and our score sheet is very specific. It has numbers on it. It has different, different criteria. So, like, if they... Um, if they score between a one and a three on uh, their length of residency in their last place, then if it's a three, then they get a certain amount of points. And if it's a one, then points are taken away. And so at the end of the day, we add up the score. And if they score a certain at a certain level, then they're acceptable. So we did that. And part of it was because it's fair housing one of those things I, I was thinking you know if we sit around and we ask each other did you like them that's not really fair is it <laughs> so, so I wanted to have some kind of system in place that I could have a you know 15 20 dollar an hour person do at the front desk and they can go through and do the check marks and and then add the score up and then they can qualify or say this person is qualified based on the criteria here that we have so that's how we do it yeah and like you said very important when it comes to fair housing, this is the system we used. They ranked here or they ranked here. Not we rolled the dice and went, eh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Maria, how about you? Um, yeah, I love that. I wish I could say I did that. Um, I don't do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we, we tried to do the same thing, all the background checks, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, you, you can be fooled even when you do everything right, even if you check all the boxes and the numbers. Um, I had somebody that applied and he was perfect in every way. I mean, huge high credit score, great job, um, had been at his last place for a long time, great references. I mean, everything just shined about this person. And um, he had been there two months when the cop showed up to arrest him for um, dealing cocaine. Um, and he was also had a felony um, warrants, outstanding warrants in Ohio as well as Texas. Um, apparently, he really liked Nike shoes. And so he would steal them by the truckloads, literally the delivery trucks that deliver Nike shoes. And those were all stored in all the closets. So I wondered why a single man wanted a three bedroom place with all these closets. Now I know it was all full of stolen Nike products. Um, but it turns out, um, and he had a long criminal record, and we did the background checks. But it turns out he had the exact same name as his father. You know, it was one of those junior senior things so he just used all his father's credentials so um but he came off really good so sometimes even the best things I, I will tell you one thing to look out for if you're interviewing tenants and they say oh you don't need to worry about all that I'll, I'll guarantee you I'm a good tenant I'm gonna pay everything up front in cash a full year's rent in cash if you're hurting and you've had a lot of renovation costs and something that sounds really tempting run just run that's all I got survey says <laughs> Connie how about you so I um, we do not run credit checks because one time many years ago someone said I'd rather have somebody that has bad credit that lives in my house because that means they probably are not going to be able to buy a house in the next two years. Tom and I like long-term tenants and our minimum goal is like five to eight years. So again, this is a particular thing that we share in our values. It doesn't mean that it's, you know, should everybody should do it. So that fits our path of wanting to have long-term people. So I look, I have a list of questions, kind of the rotor rooter and I ask them every, all kinds of questions. If you guys email me, I will send you a copy of my questions. And I'm also going to have that list of questions at, I, I shouldn't say. Oh, I was going to say, if wait, I were you, I would say if you May come 13, to the class. You got to come to the class. That's what I'll do. You got to come to class if you want to get my list of questions.
questions. So I ask them, I have them, I, um, we're not really talking about marketing right now. We're just talking about how we choose All right, so finish the um, I look strongly at rental history. One of my requirements, and again, we talked about fair housing, as long as you have standard requirements that are objective, not subjective, as long as you apply those equally across all people, then you're safe with, with fair housing. So one of my requirements is you must have two years of local rental history together. So if three, we have some rentals that are near UCF. So if I have young kids call me say, hey, we want to rent your house, blah, blah. My question is one person has to have three times the rent in income. And they also have to have the two years of local rental history. A lot of times those two standards kick out the, the standard roommate situation. So it's not that I'm, I'm biasing against roommates, it's just that they don't meet my standards. It's very convenient that I don't rent to students. <laughs> We don't want to do that. So I do have a list of questions. And one of the first things I tell people when they call me so that I don't get charged or accused of um, biasing or being prejudiced is I tell them, let me get my list of questions that I ask everyone who calls. And so I reach over and I literally get it, but I'm just telling them, let me get my list of questions that I ask everyone. So that tells the caller that you are very systematic, you're fair, and you're doing this the same way with everyone. And it gives you, when you do things right, and you do things lawfully, you sleep at night. Yeah. Things, uh, Connie, as well. I use um, uh, a company as a, as a website called Tenant Cloud. So the same questions are on this. And if they want to do apply, and again, I won't let everybody apply because it costs $45 per person. So they don't want them to lose the money if it comes back. But we will, one of the ones we won't accept if you've been evicted. So I'm going to save you $45 straight away. But what happens, the credit check comes back as well as the criminal and everything else on there. So it gives me the two for one. Now, if, if our criteria hasn't been met, then Tenant Cloud sends you um, an email saying, I'm sorry, you haven't been successful. Good luck and have you move on. But the other good thing is when you still meet them, and I, I can tell you like now, there was one guy we met, and on his criminal side, he he was most honest. He told me he'd been a felon. Now, if it involved children like that, again, he wouldn't have had a clue. He just wouldn't have had a chance. But we give the guy the chance, because I'm a big believer, if you can give them the chance. And again, it was the good feeling. We, we liked him, off he went. He was with us for 12 years. And I was so pleased when he says, well, Chris, we're leaving now. Thanks for us. Where are you going to? He has gone to Goosebumps. He says, we managed to buy our house. And I was so pleased for them because we'd give them the chance. He never let me down on the rent. And we could give him a good reference for his mortgage and everything else. So the other thing is with meeting with these people, you, to me, that is the best thing. You've got the paperwork and then you can decide. Side. But don't, don't forget, a lot of people will just roll out with the lies, and you've got to try and spot some of them. All right. Love that story. It's going to be your turn to ask some questions here in a moment, so be thinking of them. Since we're telling stories about some good examples, Maria gave us a, a kind of a good one of one where you could be fooled, but I'm kind of curious. Uh, we've had a lot of people, you know, leading up to this, we asked for some feedback questions from several folks. And one of the things that was a common theme was something along the lines of what was the worst situation? What was the worst tenant? Have you ever been scammed? Uh, something along those lines. So think for a second, what, what's something that you could tell these folks as kind of a quick short 
short story about what was the craziest thing or worst tenant uh, that you ever came across. And Connie, if you want to go first, or Maria, it looks like she's got several more stories. I can, I can think of two right offhand. All right, and go for it. One of them established my, I don't rent to people that are moving from in and out from out of town. I require them to have two years of local rental references. I don't know if you caught that earlier, but a lot of times when people are moving in from out of town, um, they're not real super stable. They're, maybe they're getting a new job and there might be some dark side to why they're moving in from out of town. They might be running away from something that they think is happening in that other place, but really the problem is, you know, in the mirror. And so I had, um, we had just bought a house. Somebody wanted to borrow uh, money from us to do a mortgage on a house. And it was right down the street from one of our other rentals. So we ended up buying it from this investor. So he flipped it to us. We renovated it fully because um, an older woman was there. I think she was a um, hoarder type of person. So it was really yuck. So we, we renovated everything. So he moved out, of, um, was coming in from out of town. His wife was still back, whatever state they were from. And they had two or three kids. And he was just polished, not, not super polished fake, the, the scary kind, you know what I'm talking about, but just very polite and professional. He was a psychologist. <laughs> So they were having a difficult time with the rent. And when they filed, I'll make the, short, the story short, they trashed the entire house. I think they were having, supposedly she was homeschooling the kids. There were handprints and things in the closets like she was locking the kids in the closets. All the door frames had cracks in them. And you guys know what cracks in the door frames are? People trying to do this and get into a room and they've been locked out. This is a psychologist and his wife. And, you know, supposedly real, they were flying the religious flag when he first, you know, came in. And I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm all about, you know, faith and stuff like that. But when they start flying the flag, the first five minutes of your conversation, beware. So anyway, um, one good thing that came out of that was when they moved out, there was about $6,000 worth of damage. And I listed everything. And one of the things that happened during the tenancy when they were not paying the rent was the wife, who I think was the psycho, um, needed to marry the psychologist, apparently, right? The psychologist, maybe he thought he could cure her. I don't know. So, daddy the wife was sending me checks. So he's sending me checks. Well, we have a financial relationship with one another because he's paying the rent. So after she moved out, the place was trashed and they would never let us in. You know, and they, they weren't there, what, a year or two? We weren't there that long. So we didn't have any suspicion that there, the place was trashed. So anyway, I made up a, an exact accurate list of everything that had been done. And I mailed a list to him and said, dear daddy, this is what your daughter and son-in-law did to our house. And we, and I sent a pack of pictures and said, um, I'm planning to, if I do not get paid by this date, I will be turning your daughter into a collection agency and she won't be able to buy a house for a long time. And I got a check within a, a week, 10 days. And it turned out, I mean, it, it wasn't great that we had to rehab the house, but we came out pretty even, Stephen. You know, it could have been a lot worse. So that and one other person that moved Finn from out of state, just so unstable. And so I said, you know what? I'm not going to rent to people who are moving in from out of state because that's not a protected class. We only have seven protected classes, right? So, um, you know, Jeff Taylor is a, a very, um, like a dry wit, and he tells you, there are only seven things that you can't, you know, discriminate against. You can discriminate against a lot of people, a lot of things. You can discriminate against um, smokers. 
You can discriminate against people who don't pay rent on time. I can discriminate against people who are moving to Florida from out of state or out of town. They don't have local rental history. And I just feel like for me, that has helped me. And we've had a lot more stable people. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things. Another story was we had, A woman who didn't spend a lot of time cleaning the house. I think she was physically unable to clean and had tons and tons and tons and tons and tons, did I say tons, of boxes of food that she had gotten from drive throughs I, she was a hoarder teacher type. I emptied 66 bags of trash in that driveway, the big contractor bags. So that, you know, don't, don't rent to people who are super sentimental about all their stuff. And, and again, it was a, a single person moving into a three bedroom house. There was the clue. Like, she had closet yeah. space. <laughs> and, and like I told her, oh, we need to put this part in the refrigerator. She goes, oh, don't worry. I don't use a refrigerator. And I was like, so when they say stuff like that, think about that and say, yeah. why is ding, that? Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, yeah. All right, moving on down. Maria, what about you? You got another one? Um, yeah, so this was um, one of those that had so many lessons learned. I told you I went to school of hard knocks, so I did everything wrong. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, well, you had some training, you had some training. But um, no, so, so this is one of those uh, situations where I had to evict somebody and we won't get into all the reasons why we had to evict him, but he was not happy about the eviction. And um, I went down there alone to clean this place out and it was three hours from my house. Oh. Yes, not within the 20 minute thing. <laughs> um, so I'm there by myself with nobody I know anywhere nearby and I start cleaning out this place that's pretty trashed and my phone starts beeping and at first I'm sort of ignoring my phone and then it just keeps beeping so finally I look at it and it says I'm watching you and he goes that's a lovely pink shirt you're wearing so on and so forth so this creep had installed cameras all over the place knowing that I was coming and he had purposely left all sorts of really nasty personal things um, on purpose and then he was texting me and then threatening that he was going to show up and anyway totally freaked me out and then he reminded me that he knew where I lived because we were stupid enough to have checks sent to our house less than learn there don't have rent checks sent to your house or have them listed on your lease or anything like that um, or have a common name that they could look up and find you anyway lots and lots of lessons learned there but I ended up you know leaving and coming back with a police officer but um, yeah anyway, that was that was creepy and scary Yikes. don't do that <laughs> Yikes. all right Tim what about you I don't know what's wrong with y'all I've had perfect tenant right I don't think so, Tim. Oh gosh, I've been doing this for forty years. You real you realize I've got I've got uh, I'm going to write a book about stories. Yeah, stories about tenants. So I was just thinking, probably the most expensive tenant exiting that I've ever personally experienced on one of my properties. I think it cost me about $25,000 in damage. We evicted a guy, and he, he was probably... Well, we evicted him pretty quick. So he, when he got out, he fought the eviction for a little bit, but once, once he got out, he actually came back after we got out and went through and just tore up all the drywall, busted the shower, did a lot of stuff, but the, the reason the reason that he ended up getting evicted is things change in people's lives, and and so you can't always tell when you when you screen them up front. They might be good for years, and he was good for a couple of years, and then all of a sudden something happened in his life, something changed. I think he got messed up with some drugs, and the next thing we knew, no rent was coming in, so we had to evict him. And then when we kicked him out, he came back and just just trashed the place. But you know what? I did have uh, insurance for that. 
I was surprised. I called my insurance company. I said, hey, do I have any vandalism insurance? And they said, yeah, you do. I said, great. So they came out and they did an adjustment. I think I got a check for like 225 bucks or something. So anyways. All right. Uh, Chris, how about you? A mine's very new, like last week. Um, oh. We had um, these tenants that have been with us like, well, 12 months. They moved up from Miami and they've been in the services and whatnot. So we, everything worked out. Yeah, okay, move in. So after this is a three bedroom, two baths. So uh, him and his partner moved into this house. So after about two months, I, I need to go over there and I can hear these dogs. And we use petscreening.com. And uh, you know, again, if you if you can have dogs as long as the right breed and everything, we're fine with it. But they put on no. Okay. So he says, well, they're his sister's dogs because he was having to go off somewhere. Yeah, okay, no problem. Anyway, I didn't have to go back for five or six months, and I hear these dogs again. So uh, I sent him a letter and said, look, you, you told me last time about these dogs, they're going to have to go. Anyway, it was my fault. I didn't follow up. So uh, they moved out, say, about two weeks ago because we didn't renew the lease. And this is my fault now because I, I should have followed up the first time. Uh, and I always say that, you know, it, so we have a saying, it's my house, but it's your home. So you have to enjoy it. If you want to paint, that's fine, as long as it isn't jet black, and as long as you put it back to what it, what it is after. And it's all wrote down on the lease. Anyway, uh, they said they were painted, they left, they didn't. So we've got blue and red walls all over the place right now. Also, the two dogs, the, it had laminate flooring through the house. It absolutely stinks. So we've taken all the flooring up. That's gone now. And uh, it's going to be rented in two weeks. The beauty of it is that we took two months deposit. But the other thing is that I've just been amazed how this guy, for the last nine months, our Florida has paid his rent. So he actually says to us, you know, you know you've got your rent on time. And I'm thinking, well, it isn't from you, though. And again, like Tim says, these people sometimes have some problems. So what he did is, going back to what Connie says, I lowered my standards a little bit. I went for these people and allowed the dog. And the, the, the dogs was a mistake. If we hadn't had all this extra money, because I said he could stay another 17 days as long as he paid us a month's rent, which he did. So we've actually had two and a half extra months rent which will pay for this damage but if I'd, carry, if I'd carried on properly as I normally would then I wouldn't have had the problem wow all right so I have only like 900 more questions I could ask but we're getting close to the top of the hour here yes Connie at least for me, I bet all of you could probably agree that whenever we make these mistakes or we have bad things happen, I try to think back and say, now, can I correct, adjust, pivot some of my policies to prevent this? And the one with the 66 bags of trash was probably about 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago. And she had no rental history of her own. She came from um, a, um, a state university in West Virginia. My mom's from West Virginia. I found a little kinship with my peeps. And she was a room mother for this college. Doesn't that sound nice? Like, you know, it doesn't sound like somebody who's a hoarder. <laughs> So that, I've, I've prevented a lot of problems by requiring two years of rental history. And I heard um, a guru say, I don't train tenants. Short sentence, I don't train tenants. And it's simple. It's not mean. It's, it's something that you hold as a standard. So there's absolutely something objective that you can check, rental history. You can go back to Mary Ann Gennetti and see that they rented a house at 1151 Brown Street in Orlando for three years. And they paid, you know, $1,800 a month. 
So again, you're setting yourself up in the safety of um, you know, fair housing. When you require rental history, you can go back and point to something and say, this is something hard and fast that you failed to do. You did not pay your rent on time. Awesome. All right, we've got time for one or two questions, depending upon what the questions are and how good the answers are. Who's got one? I see one right here. All right. Are felons a protected class? Are felons a protected class? Great question. That is a, um, a, a, a sensitive topic right now, and um, I would refer you to Harry Heist's website, and he has videos, and he talks about this, and I think uh, what I've heard, I think, is that you should say that an individual's um, criminal history will be evaluated independently for each application because it's kind of a combination of whether they have misdemeanors, whether they have felonies and things like that. And Harry Heist has, I haven't really faced that much with people with um, felonies or, or, you know, um, so um, yeah, the short answer, stuff. the short answer to your question is no, they're not a protected class. It's not one of the seven, okay. but there are some, there's some gray areas out there right now. Des because of the disparate, what do they call it? Impact. disparate yeah. Yeah. impact. Disparate impact um, has caused people to look at different felonies differently, especially drug felonies. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, there's a little bit of a gray area, but if you have um, in, your, in your criteria, if you specifically say we don't rent to anyone who has a drug felony within the last three years, you can do that because it, it, it really goes to, this is your, your criteria. Yeah, if you use that, it, it can be him. So. And if you are your own, you know, owner, manager, you know, there are websites that you can use that have screening questions that are kind of like, do you want to ask this question, that question, are these no goes, goes. Um, what I like about using some of those separate things is not every application hits your desk to where you have to look at them, so to speak. And also there's an application fee associated with that you're not pocketing, okay? It's the website is gonna take that application fee. So I like having an application fee because it'll say right on there, hey, we're gonna do a background check. We're gonna look at your criminal history. So don't pay the fee if you know there's something that's gonna come up, essentially, that you, you know is gonna disqualify you. And nobody can say, well, you're just marketing this property for three months collecting application fees. Um, so anyway, it, it helps weed out some people. So if you're not already using one of those sites, I would recommend it because there's usually not any cost to the landlords. They make their money from those application fees, but it weeds out a lot of people. And that, with, with those um, websites, say like I use one, but also it protects me. I don't need your social security number or anything. So now I don't have to look after all that information. It goes through to that company you pay that company i haven't had anything from it so that protects me again one more thing yep. i also wanted to add that i know i said that i don't do credit checks however i do lots of other checks i use a, um, a website tenant alert and i check previous rental i check previous addresses and see if that lines up with the addresses on my application if i find any kind of addresses that are listed to them i research those i've been known to knock on people's doors in orlando or somewhere in the you know local region Region and go, hey, you know, Betsy Swift over here says that she rented, you know, I, I have an app, and I always show my application signature because you always get a signature that allows you to verify this stuff. And they'll say, wow, I, I'm surprised that she listed me as a landlord. I'm like, oh no, she didn't. <laughs> so I do a lot of other checking. I just don't care about credit. Great, great point. Now, how many of you are teaching on Friday the 13th in May? Three, 
you are going to be teaching. I know Connie is. Anybody else? I'm on vacation. You're on vacation. Yeah, you said that twice already. I think he's going to be on vacation, don't you? <laughs> awesome. Well, for everybody, since not everybody's going to be at that, would you guys very quickly give your contact information again before we start to close everything out? Well, I want to I want to close with our best tenant or a good tenant story. I don't know that, that we have time to do that. It is eight o'clock oh, and we have a heart okay. finish. So okay. if you well, give your contact I get chocolate information. every Valentine's Day from one of my tenants. Nice. <laughs> but you can contact me 407 492 3212 or C as in Connie O'Hanlon O H A N L O N 21 at gmail.com. Thank you, Johnny. And Maria? Maria at Blue Viking Properties.com or 407 832 4242. Thank you, Tim. Um, it's 407 624 4000 extension 102 or you can email me at uh, T Davis all county metro.com davis at allcountymetro.com all right and chris and mine is again is 407-230-5731 and my email address is chris at cderentals.com and there's no website it'll come up <laughs> under construction <laughs> all right we promised everybody we do a couple of door prices we do have two for tonight is leslie hargrove harrington here is she like, oh there, there you are i was gonna say i thought i saw you earlier yeah. you won one of our door prizes thank you all right cool awesome yeah, practice your clapping because I'm going to make you clap even more in a minute. And is Julia Dumont here? There's Julia. Hey. Yes. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Can we get a huge round of applause for our panelists tonight? And I think you guys know there is plenty more you can ask and learn, and you can find that on May 13th at the Landlording Academy. So I suggest you sign up and learn even more. Where's the meeting after the meeting? Wow, that was terrible. Let's try that again. Where's the meeting after the meeting? Oh my goodness, you guys need to practice for next month. Have a safe time. See you guys later.